especially established companies who are making money saying, we really want to use your work, but we don't want to pay you for it, but you're going to get exposure for it. You know what? Fuck exposure is what I've learned because guess what? I've done a lot of deals like that. I've done free work for people and they're like, oh, you're going to get this great exposure, this, that. And And I was like, what exposure did I get? You got some free work. You didn't really shout me out that much. And then it was, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in working for free for exposure because I feel like if you're a big corporation, you can pay me and don't give me exposure because I, I have the rights to those designs. I'll just post it on my portfolio to say I did it. And boom, that's my exposure to say, oh, well, you did that such and such logo. Perfect. I don't like, I, I've gotten burned so many times that way. I just don't do it. Like, and if I do free work, it's not, it's not for anybody who has a lot of money. All right. I am back with my friend. I met at one of the have missions that we've been doing for Jose, the coffee guy. This is Kennedy page. Kennedy is a former army guy. Kennedy say (laughs) hi. What's up guys. (laughs) So you live here in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. How long have you uh, been in Texas? So what, what was it like for you to go ahead and pack out your little barracks room knowing you're going to Korea, going overseas all by yourself? I was scared because, like, I'm 18. I had never, like, been away from home, let alone another fucking country at that point. I was like, because I asked somebody, I said, where is this? They were like, oh, that's Korea. I said, huh? I said, how can I get out of that? (laughs) I was like, what? I don't want to go to Korea. But I loved Korea. Like, all my lessons, all the things that I was was scared to do when I actually got into them, loved. Like, loved Korea. And if I would have known better or if I had been more mature at the time, I would have stayed in Korea longer. So for you guys... um the Navy is a little weird, uh, especially for the corpsman side. Like when I got t- t- uh, cut over to the Marines, mm-hmm. we have to go find our personnel people. They're, they're like a Marine battalion does not have the equivalent of a Navy, what we'd call a personnel specialist, an HR person with them. Mm-hmm. That's way far away. But when you guys move as a unit are you deployed to like a hr command or are you uh, deployed or assigned to an infantry unit and you're doing hr for the infantry both so like with hr i could be at um a company level which is like an orderly room clerk uh then you have your s1 then you have like your brigade s1 and then like what i finished on one of my militaries i was in um Uh, HR, HRSC, which was just like a human resources, something or another, but it was, it facilitated over the the base of Fort Shafter at at the time. So literally I could, I could be in anywhere. Uh, Luckily I I had never, I was an orderly room clerk once and that's because they wanted me to deploy with the company. Uh, But other than that, I always worked at S1s. Okay. So when you got to Korea, did you go to, what did you go to? I, when I went to Korea, I went to S1. So I went to the, the battalion S1. How was, was that an infantry battalion? Uh, what was, oh, I have no clue. At this point, I'd have to look at my ERB <laughs> to tell you. I just remember that I was on Camp Humphreys. Uh, I don't remember that unit at all. Yeah, I don't. don't well, you know that, that could either. be a good thing because obviously you didn't get into very much trouble as a no. as a new boot. So how I told you I was I was good. Like I listen. Like the I tell people all the time. I was like, shit, the military's easy. I said, just listen. 
listen and do what they say. I was like, if it's not illegal or immoral, do it. <laughs> and so, so how was the culture for uh, Korea? Like when you finally got settled in and you, you know, your day to day is going and you get liberty, which for those who aren't military listening to this, it's when you're off of work and you get to go off base or even on base. How was, uh, how was Korea for you? You know what? Korea was nice. Like, so some of the people there were really nice. Like, they would teach me how to say thank you, hello, like, like, I remember some of those things, like the basics. Hello, thank you. You're welcome. So, <laughs> um, so like, I had somebody teach me that. But in Korea, you have these things called katusis, which is the military, uh, the Korean military. So in Korea, you're obligated to do two years in the military. And so I had Katusas who taught me some of the lingo. And so when I went out to amongst all the other Koreans, it was good. And people, for the most part, actually were pretty friendly and tried to work with you. Didn't get mad that I just knew English. Uh, well, some of the stuff was in English. So. It actually wasn't that much of a shock. I was just like, okay, cool. Uh, so people, just different color. That's it. That's kind of crazy to think that, you know, people of different backgrounds can get along, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. It was it was pretty cool. Very helpful. So um, what was your time like? Just what did you guys do during the day in the office? Well, in the office, I was an NCOER clerk, which uh, that's... Since we were in the Navy, that's evaluations. I don't know what you call your evaluations. I guess we for call NCOs. Them, we, we just call them evals. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I was in charge of doing um, evaluations, reading them, making sure they had, they were correct, how we kick them back. And the thing about it is, at the time, I was a private. So, you know, NCOER is for NCOs. So, it was... A, a lot of NCOs and first sergeants had to talk to me and I would tell them that, sorry, you have this wrong. This is what you have to correct. And if they didn't like my answer, I would go to my NCOIC and be like, well, here you go. You know, you see it's incorrect. <laughs> and I remember this one time, this first sergeant got so mad because I didn't stand at parade rest form, but I was working. Like, I can't work for you and also stand at parade rest at the same time. And so I was just like, you, which one? So he, like, he told my NCIC, and I told him, I was like, I said, I can't do both. I can't stand at parade rest and still do the work he wants. I said, that makes no sense. But I guess he wanted me to stand at parade rest so he could tell me at ease so then I could do work. That was crazy as shit. Welcome to the crazy military. And I was like, yeah, no. So when you were um, going through all this, do you think looking back now, um, being so junior and having to work with these senior NCOs, even though some of the stuff they probably told you was pretty stupid, that it helped you gain some confidence for later in your career? Yeah, because it's kind of like I knew what I was dealing with. You know, it's like I knew... I was already dealing with NCOs. I knew their responsibilities because one, I was reading their responsibilities all damn day. <laughs> so it's just like I kind of had a head start on it. Here I am, private, and I'm I, I'm privy to all things NCOs do or are in charge of, and things like that. I'm talking to NCOs, so it was good. It did. It really did build my confidence. So as we'll get to in a bit, you're an entrepreneur. You're a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. Do you think learning, um, being in those situations as a young private helps you now uh, trying to get new clients? Yes, because it taught me how to talk to people. Like, which is weird because sometimes in groups, I'm a little timid. But in general, I know how to talk to people. Like, I can talk to anybody. Like, and I'm just like, cool. And that's what my wife tells me all the time. She's like... You can just talk to anybody. Anybody just talks to you. I was like, well, I like people, you know. So, like, it taught me how to just interact with people, which is very helpful from with a graphic design, from a graphic design standpoint. 
yeah, I can completely understand that. So after you get done, how long did you end up spending in Korea? How many years? I just did one year. I did one year and then I. Oh wow. I came to Fort Hood. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was only at Fort Hood for six months and then I deployed for 18. Oh damn. So you're. This, I mean 15. So this is what 2007 ish that you're at Fort Hood. Yeah, 2000. Yeah, 2006, almost seven. So if I remember right, it sounds like uh, you and Nick Valentine may have been there around the same time. I don't know when he was in. Yeah, we we just his podcast just posted yesterday. I think he did his either his last tour or his second to last tour right there. He said he's been in Fort Hood, that area for about 15 years. Damn. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah, so literally, you, I was there six months, deployed, came back, went to brag. Well, <laughs> you know, Nick's crazy because he started his uh, his nonprofit and decided that he liked Fort Hood so much he's just gonna live by Fort Hood. So you know. Oh no, no, so, thank you. So where did you go with Fort Hood? Uh, I went to Afghanistan, and that's when remember when they were extending tours for the army. Oh yeah. Uh, like we found out that we were being extended like right after Christmas was it, it was either right after Christmas or right before Christmas. They were like, Oh, and by the way, you're staying those additional three months. I believe that's called Merry fucking Christmas gift. Hello. Yeah. And it was just like, you want to fuck with morale? Hello. Tell them we're going to stay three more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you got to Fort hood from Korea Mm -hmm. You're there for six months. At what point did they tell you, um, remember you're in the army and you may have to go fight in a war? Uh, as soon as I got there. Oh, really? Yeah. It was like, they were already ramping up to go and getting prepared. So like, as soon as I got to that unit, which is a, I went, I was in a med log unit then 583rd med log. I knew that we were deploying. Oh, okay. So you knew ahead of time then. Yeah. So were you a, were you still a private or had you picked up a specialist? At that point, I was a specialist. So were you telling your younger um, soldiers to stand at parade rest to talk to you? No, not as a specialist. <laughs> no, you know what? Time out. I was a PFC when I went to Fort Hood. Um, I didn't make specialist until right before we deployed. And then I ended up making sergeant while we were deployed. And that was interesting because, you know, I came in as a private and then I outranked everybody as, <laughs> as I stayed there. So that was different. That's pretty impressive that you made um, sergeant within 18 months of putting on. Uh, it was, it was a little less than two years. So like right when that window was open, I was able to go to the board and cause I was deployed when I pinned on five. So if I was deployed, that was like 2007. Yeah, around two years. That's crazy. I, I, I did really like, I did really good. And the only reason I slowed down is because the next duty station I went to at Fort Bragg, uh, the NCIC didn't like me. That, that's what they and, all say. And because I didn't want to go airborne, which was like a big fucking deal there. Like because I didn't want to go airborne, they she didn't want to she didn't want to help me at all. It, like she was truly unhelpful. Like she would, my NCIC was mad because she came from a schoolhouse, and I was already very knowledgeable at that point in human resources. Uh, but she wasn't knowledgeable because she wasn't in the S one anymore. She mm. was like at a schoolhouse. Oh, okay. So she would take all my information and pretend like it was hers. Like she would take credit, anything I did good, she took credit for. Oh damn! Anything, it was it was crazy. I hated it. It was the worst fucking duty station. So let's back up real quick before we get to Fort Bragg, and okay, them trying to throw you out of airplanes. How was it when you found when you realize you're going to Afghanistan? I'm guessing at some point in time you get some leave and you got to go talk to your to your mom. Yeah, I just tell her. 
How'd she handle it? I just be like, my mom, you know, um, my mom cool. She is real cool. (laughs) She's real cool. She's she's real cool. Uh, She was just like, okay, you know, be safe. Like, but during that deployment, she was great. She was sending my care packages and it was wonderful. She was a great supporter. (laughs) Like, truly. Like, they were worried, of course, yeah, because yeah, I'm in Afghanistan, but, you know, they didn't bring their worries to me. So, like, I didn't have any additional worries on top of, you know, going to Afghanistan myself. That's a good thing. So, did were you married at the time or not yet? No, I didn't get married until after I got out of the military. Oh, okay. So, you... um you deploy and you said you were with the medlock unit. So were you guys out of like Bagram or Canada? Yeah, we were, we were on Bagram. So how was that? I mean, I've seen, I've never been to Afghanistan. I've seen pictures. Obviously we just shut it down like in the last couple of weeks. That place looked like it was a small city. It, it was. Bagram was nice. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Bagram, because you know that's like the main base. That it had everything. You had pizza, coffee beans. It was in, you. Uh, what was it called? You had bazaars. Like it wasn't terrible, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't bad at all. Really, I worked out a lot. I went to my room. And that was it. So did they do any training for you guys? Like, did they get you on guns or any of that prior to deploying? Or was the expectation we're just going to work out of the office on base the whole time? You know what? No, like we didn't do. Because when I hear about people going to like JRTC, uh, not JRTC. uh, I think, no, it's a JRTC. Louisiana? Mm, Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, Polk. Um. Yeah, we didn't do any type of, like, additional training like that. So I was like, oh, okay. Like, when people tell me about their deployments and they're like, oh, we're going here to train for it. I've never, and I've deployed only twice, but I've never done those additional trainings. Oh, that's crazy. So during the time that you were there, was there, uh, I know Bagram would get hit every so often. Did you guys take any yeah. any craziness at all? Bagram, it, we did get hit uh, a few times. It was nothing like Kandahar. Oh my gosh, Kandahar got hit like every fucking night. Like, because I remember I, I was at, I went to Kandahar, and it was just like we were always hearing the alarms and sirens go off. But Bagram wasn't that bad. Bagram was considered, you don't want to say safe because we're in a war zone, but it was not as hot as other places. Like, like as safe as. You can be in a war zone. Yeah, as safe as you can be in a war zone. Because we got hit every now and then, but it was nothing like, it was nothing like other people places were getting hit. Do you remember your first time you guys took a something that rattled you? No, no. I remember having to go to the bunker like once, and I was like, "What's going on?" Like I had my full gear on and stuff, and we were just sitting in there waiting for the clearance, but. In those moments, I don't remember being scared. I was just like, you know, what is it we need to do? So we not hide. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how long? So you were there until February, what, 2008, roughly? Almost. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. 2008, because I deployed again in 2009. Yeah. So what was the coming home like for you? Great. Oh, my gosh. So I, I surprised my sister uh, when I came home. Like, I, I was like, don't tell anybody. And I had a party. It was fun. Like, I had a great welcome back. It was, it was really good. Family's very supportive. Family all got together. We just had a party. 